okay, the intercultural integration approach has three key principles. One is uh, the recognition and celebration of diversity, all kinds of diversity. So, of course, cultural, but also uh, age-wise, you know, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, etc. And, of course, professional and class. It's very important to recognize that diversity has an impact on public policy, uh, both in terms of its goals, but also in terms of how you involve people in the definition of public policies. The second key principle is equality, so ensuring there is no discrimination, but also ensuring effective equality, so not just formal, but also equality of outcome, and that might require some affirmative action in some cases. And finally, the third principle is uh, positive interaction or meaningful interaction. And that's probably the most specific principle about intercultural integration. Uh, it's based on the con contact theory, uh, which proves that when people are um, doing things together towards a common goal, when they're co-creating, uh, that also <coughs> generates trust and uh, cohesion and builds bridges. So these are the three main principles of intercultural interaction, but there are others. It's uh, the diversity advantage, for instance, which mm -hmm. means that uh, you base your policy on the assets of what people bring, the diverse people, rather than on their deficits. It's a whole range of policy. That's why we are advocating a strategic approach that starts with the public narrative. Uh, this is both a narrative by the public officials, uh, politicians, but also administrative uh, policy makers, as well as uh, the narrative in media. But they are, of course, connected, because the media reflect the, what the politicians and public officials say. Uh, other policies in terms of changing perceptions, it's again the interaction or uh, the mixing of people in institutions and the public space. So the, what we have realized, I think it's common knowledge, is that in areas where the fewest migrants, the, the least diversity, the, the prejudice and the fears are the most. That proves that whenever people actually live together and can experience each other and get to know each other, that's uh, one of the best ways to uh, defeat fear and prejudice. However, it's not automatic. You need to engineer it a little bit. You need to create certain conditions and also create certain types of actions and mediate. You don't leave it because, of course, always conflicts and misunderstandings can arise. So you need also trained professionals that can mediate and ensure that the interaction is actually constructive. Mm -hmm. Well, there is a whole body of literature. Um, that demonstrates the diversity advantage. First of all, there is a migration advantage, and there's a lot of economic research into that. It shows that uh, whenever there is migrants in cities or in enterprises or in whole countries, they become more productive, also more dynamic and more creative, because migrants will bring different perspectives to things, different ways of doing things, so they actually can innovate. Um, but also, uh, it's just simply by um, creating more international contacts and trade and exporting ideas. So there's many ways that in which migration enriches societies, but there's also a benefit to diversity itself. So it doesn't only have to be through migration, it could be historic diversity. Uh, it's also diversity of other factors uh, that brings value. And it's, again, because people have different perspectives of things. They're not thinking in the same way. And that's how you, you make progress in everything from, from education, I don't know, learning from uh, the way in China you teach mathematics, which is a bit superior and more productive than what we do in Europe, or learning of how in Asia they treat Alzheimer based on human contact and less medication. So it's always between, you know, learning from difference that makes the difference, that makes, uh, that, that helps. But this, again, you have to prepare people because most people are not open enough uh, to, to hear another perspective. They, they tend to think, especially managers and 
decision making that they know it all. So this kind of humbleness and openness of mind has to be cultivated through public policy education in particular. In principle, devolution, decentralization of power, it's a good thing in most policy areas. So the more power is decentralized, and actually not even only within cities, but to cities, but also within cities. So at the sub-urban level, neighborhood level, uh, for a lot of the decisions in relation to urbanism services, um, even economy, it's really good to de-lock, decentralize decision making. And of course, indeed, cities should have more uh, power to deal with uh, all the areas relating to intercultural policies, and especially so education services, uh, cultural policies, or transport, economy, all, all fields are concerned. Um, but sometimes you also need to centralize decision making because that allows to redistribute resources. Uh, because unfortunately, if you, because unfortunately, wealth and economic growth is not equally distributed among areas. Mm -hmm. So you also need some more central decision making to make sure that areas are treated equally. Mm -hmm. So you can redistribute, and you can also create the same conditions for all citizens. Otherwise, those who live in luckier or richer areas will be advantaged. So that's not that's not correct. The, it's really important also that states take uh, very seriously their, their work in terms of safety and ensuring the protection of everybody, as well as uh, having a sound immigration policy. Because if citizens don't believe that the right to entry is fair but also enforced, mm -hmm. uh, they, will not, they will be afraid of migration. So only when citizens know that there are rules that are respected, then they are happy to share and, and be welcome. Mm -hmm. I think the administration has to be really rethought. Nowadays, we are far too much legalistic in terms of public administration, and far not enough in, intrapreneurial. Mm -hmm. I really think we should train public administrators to be interpreters, to, to, to take initiative, to independently analyze situations and take initiative. We should apply what is called the commander's intent. So, so far administrations function really top down with all decisions taken at the top level. So the lower levels where actually work is done are uh, not empowered. To empower the lower, local, lower levels means to make the strategic decisions at, at upper levels and then let each level of administration decide themselves how to achieve the goals. So really meaning empowering individual employees to make decisions and to be creative and even take risks. There are some administrations that do that. For instance, in Copenhagen, the Department of Culture, uh, they gave bonus points to employees who mm, make mistakes. Because if you make mistakes, that means you've taken risks, so you have done something different. 